All right, welcome everybody. You are here for optimizing network performance for Amazon EC2 instances. Welcome. So uh, I'm Nick Matthews. I'm a solution architect. Um, my sort of day job is I help uh, our partners and customers do a lot of network things. A lot of times uh, performance comes up. Um, we also have got uh, Vishvesh over here. He's going to help us out later with some of the uh, details about how it works internally under the hood. Uh, so sort of the, the reason why we're all here, hopefully, is uh, for network performance. Uh, you know, uh, I've been a network engineer for a long time, or relatively long time, I don't know. Um, and so these things make sense to me. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've learned, especially here, is that um, you know, a lot of people aren't network engineers. Uh, but networking, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how much you like networking, is everywhere. And so it, it impacts you all the time. Uh, and uh, one of the big questions always is like, is the network the problem? Or like, if can I you know, increase the performance of my cluster or my application by improving the network? Or like, what options do I have to improve network performance? And so the whole idea of that is, you know, for those of you that especially aren't maybe networking experts, uh, it can be a bit of a black box. And so the concept here today is we're going to go through so a few concepts and really sort of look a little bit deeper inside uh, network performance, how it works, and sort of what makes it tick. So uh, we're going to start with some basic performance concepts. Uh, for some of you, this might be basic. For some of this, might be sort of interesting. Uh, basic global things that exist everywhere in the world, like TCP, how they work, and why they matter, and a little bit of how to deal with some of those uh, parameters that come in from that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we have on AWS in terms of features and uh, families, instance families, those kinds of things that will impact your performance. Then we'll talk about some of the architectural decisions you can make about your, you know, the decisions you make and the, the components you use and how that impacts your performance. And then like the, some of the testing methodology and some sort of tips there. So basic global performance concepts. Um, these are some terms some of you may know, some of you may not. Uh, bandwidth, bandwidth is essentially uh, you know, how big is the possible throughput for that link? So if you have a 10 gigabit per second link, that's the bandwidth of that link. Uh, so that's usually what a lot of people focus on for, band for performance, but it's not always, or, and quite often, is not actually uh, the major impact for performance. Uh, latency is often the more likely cause of performance issues. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Latency is a famous, or a uh, fancy word for how long it takes for a packet to go from one place to another. Uh, throughput is, okay, so maybe I have a 10 gigabit per second circuit, that's my bandwidth, but how much traffic can I actually get on that? Uh, so whatever the, your effective bandwidth on that, or your effective data transfer on that is your throughput, and that's what you actually care about, because that's what applications actually depend on. Uh, as well as jitter. Jitter is just, I think it's a silly word, and I like it. Um, it's my favorite performance word, but jitter is the, uh, basically the, the inter-arrival packet delays times. So if I send you a packet every 20 milliseconds, so you get a packet 20 seconds, 20 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, you just experienced jitter. We didn't lose any packets, but that packet came in 30 milliseconds later than we thought it would. And so that matters with things like voice or IP applications and some real-time applications video where you're buffering and that can actually be uh, equivalent to losing the packet. And so, that, you know, we'll talk about some of those types of use cases. Uh, you know, to show you exactly how sort of TCP works in a nutshell, we've got two instances here. Uh, we're going to transfer some data between them. Uh, so what does this look like? We want to transfer data. What's the bandwidth of the circuit? Let's say it's 10 gigs. Uh, let's say the latency is 500 milliseconds. So for us to send the data to the other side it takes 500 milliseconds. And I'm going to use lazy math uh, because then the return path also takes 500 milliseconds, so it takes one second. Of, you know, unless you're sending traffic through a, like a satellite, this is not realistic. Um, but I, for the purposes of us not wanting to do very complicated math today, we're going to assume that round trip takes one second. So what's the actual throughput here? The throughput is basically however big that packet is. So if that's a 1,400 byte packet, we now have you know, uh, 1,400 bytes that we sent in one second. That's not very many. That's like 1.4 kilobytes, right? That's not very big. Um, so how do we improve that? If we, if we know that latency, in this case, this is like that classic scenario of like, I've got a 10 gig link, why am I not getting 10 gigs? And that's because there's latency involved. Uh, so for example, if you have something that has two milliseconds or versus 200 milliseconds, that could change your effective bandwidth from something like 80 megabits per second to eight kilobits per second, depending upon your sort of sizes. Uh, the way you actually 
change this is do, you can send more data in that packet. So change the, the MTU, so basically the maximum packet size. Uh, the internet and most normal networks are 1,500 bytes. That's very, very standard. Uh, you can also do that with jumbo MTUs, so up to 9,000. So if you own the network, like in your own VPC or peered VPC, uh, it's up to 9,000. You don't always have control of that. So the standard way to do this is actually through TCP. It's an invisible thing you never really care about or control. And every single time you do an HTTP sort of request or anything over TCP, this stuff, there's some really actually cool algorithms if you're cool, like you want to go into it. Uh, but TCP is actually super, super complicated. And the reason why it's lasted, what is it, 25 years old now, is because of these congestion window algorithms where they say, you know, uh, how, much, how many packets should I send if I get some losses, if there's latency. That's, it's very, very complicated stuff, but the short story is, you know, if you're not dropping any packets, they send more and more and more packets. And so uh, what you really want to do is you want to optimize and send more and more packets to get higher bandwidth, especially over, over higher latencies. So uh, when does latency really matter? Uh, there's a couple of use cases. One is anytime you're doing sort of cross-region connectivity, so if it's some sort of global application. You may have users all over the world. Some of them might be coming over Ethernet over barbed wire. Um, and so you really never know that, that bandwidth, or sorry, the, the latency there. Uh, the other one's like for clustering. Uh, sometimes those, these clusters, like nanoseconds and fractions and fractions of a second, uh, basically can have a huge impacts on the, the bandwidth of the cluster, as well as things like elastic cache and memcache that have that same sort of clustering functionality. So if, if you have a latency issue, what can you do? Um, you can tune it, so you can set larger MTUs if you own the network. If not, you can do some TCP tuning uh, we'll talk about a few examples of that. Uh, you can also just make the network more efficient, so less loss and those kinds of things. So we'll go through some of those examples. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can also just not fight it, make friends with physics. Fighting latency is a very, very hard thing to do. Very people beat physics. Um, and so you can just make your things closer together. So uh, exa for example, in, in the high level, you can choose the right regions to operate in, which is in the range of tens of milliseconds. You can choose maybe to operate in one region between different availability zones or even a single availability zone. Uh, that gets you in like the one to two millisecond sort of range. Or you can also go into a placement group where we can guarantee your instances are very, very close together and they're sort of in that less than a millisecond sort of area. In terms of uh, packets per second, that's another very important uh, input to the, the sort of performance equation. So packets per second uh, matters for a couple things. One is every single time your operating system receives a packet, the kernel has to do some work on that packet to find out how to process it, how to manipulate the underlying data. And so you, you take CPU and I.O. load to you know, do packet processing. Uh, not just that, but the underlying infrastructure, the infrastructure that AWS operates, we have to process all those packets as well. And so every instance type has packets per second limits and what we can do and what our hardware can do. And so, if, especially if you have some type of applications that are particularly high packets per second, uh, transactional systems, um, routing and firewall sort of systems where you've got routing instances on an uh, EC2 instance, um, any of those kinds of things, or if you've got very small packets uh, for whatever reason, the packets per second is likely uh, one of the things that you need to focus on. So one of the things you can do if you have control over it is the uh, MTU. So inside of a... VPC or peered VPC, the maximum MTU is 9,001. I think we just chose one extra than 9,000 to prove that we could. Um, 9,000, a very standard jumbo MTU size. Um, so you can do this, and this, this means you have the same amount of packets per second, but you're getting more effective data out of that. And so if you care about that type of thing and you think packets per second is an issue, I would try increasing the MTU and see if you get better performance. Uh, the other one here is loss. So if someone says, hey, we've got 1% packet loss, we're only dropping one out of 100 packets, is that bad? Yeah, it's bad, you don't want that. Because uh, even with 1% loss with most TCP algorithms, 1% uh, loss, you're gonna have about 46% of your entire throughput, as opposed to if you had 0% loss. So if, if you can measure loss, and if you can look at those types of things on your systems, uh, that's gonna have a very, very high effect of your effective throughput. And so you want to figure out where those losses are happening and minimize that. It might be because maybe you've got too small of an instance, and so the instance is just not able to handle the network path coming to it. Uh, it could be because of your carriers or other networks in the middle. Um, but network loss can be you know, 
very, very detrimental and is probably the biggest impact to your, your, your basically to your performance. Now, this is different than UDP. So UDP, you lose a packet, it just keeps on sending packets. It's just UDP just <laughs> sends packets all day long. It doesn't care if any of them get lost. And so that's actually a useful testing technique we'll talk about later. If, you, if you're not sure if your bandwidth is high or not, you can test UDP traffic because it will saturate the link. Uh, if you do actually want to check the loss on your operating system and for a, a given application, you're going to do a net stat and look for retransmissions. And that will tell you, you know, what level of loss you've got. Uh, and you may want to clear some of these over time because they can tend to build up. Uh, so let's take an example application. So I'll talk about a couple of sort of high-level concepts. Uh, so two servers want to talk to each other. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a high transaction rate HTTP service. So maybe there's an API server or a transactional server, something like that. So the actual testing scenario is something like this, where we have a server, we have a client. Uh, there's about 80 milliseconds around trip time, so that's roughly equivalent to maybe east coast to west coast. Um, 1,500 MTU, so that's the standard internet packet size. Uh, we're going to do 200,000 requests for a, you know, a 10,000 size uh, object, so maybe just a, a, fairly, a fairly small web page of some sort, or a transaction. And what we really want to do is we want to make sure that we, we're minimizing latency, um, but we don't, we don't have necessarily control of the network, so what can we do? Uh, so in this scenario, we're going to mess with the initial window size. So initial congestion window basically says, hey, when you start sending me data, send me three packets of data at a time. Um, and if we're good with that, and we, you know, that's going good for a while, let's increase that over time. Uh, but you can modify that, that, that tuning parameter to say, like, hey, my network quality I know is actually really good, so let's start off by sending me more packets. So with three packets, you know, it takes 320 milliseconds to do that, that request, and the average bandwidth is roughly you know, uh, 10, or sorry, 12 megabits per second. If we increase that to 10 packets, we now get to, we're decreasing the time by about, what, 100 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, something like that. And then 16, if we go to 16 packets, we're at now 160 milliseconds, and two megabits per second. You know, you can go pretty high on this. If you go too high, then, you know, it's actually going to send too much traffic. You'll have some loss, and then it will immediately back down. So you have to find that sort of, that Goldilocks zone where it's, it's high enough for your network, but not too high. Uh, and so, you know, we can basically increase the, the latency or the bandwidth of this by, you know, 79% just by tuning some operating system parameters. Um, the actual example of this here is, is here where in IP route command, uh, I basically add this init CWND to 16. Uh, you know, this session is not necessarily an operating system tuning class. Um, this is really specific to, you know, how it relates to AWS. So we're not going to go into all the, the TCP tuning stuff. Um, so here's some other example things you can change. So the receive window, the congestion control algorithms, um, you know, how fast or slow that the TCP algorithm will send more or less packets. Um, retransmission timers and how long it will wait for a packet. If you know your uh, network is very low latency, you can set that window very small because if you just didn't get it after 100 milliseconds, you know, like, it's just gone. It's, we're never going to get it because we know their average latency is five milliseconds or something like that. Um, so uh, up next, we're going to talk about some of the AWS network performance features and sort of how performance works specifically on AWS as well as some of the history of, like, what's going on in the hood of your instance and those kinds of things. So fish fish, everybody. Yeah, we see the clap for you this time. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, so um, I wanted to talk briefly about how you can achieve maximum network performance on EC2 instances, but also about how we got to achieving that maximum performance. By the way, spoiler alert, to achieve the maximum performance, just run our latest generation instances. You, in most circumstances, you would get pretty great performance. Um, but it's been a journey. So I'm going to talk about how we arrived there with what are substantial improvements in latency, packet rate, and throughput. And it's all about the Nitro system. Um, it's an evolution of Nitro, which is a lightweight hypervisor that manages CPU and memory efficiently and provides you with uh, near bare metal performance for most of your applications. Uh, it's a Nitro card which offloads a bunch of the processing functionality, all of the, off, offloads all of the storage and network processing, and a bunch of virtual machine management to, again, provide you with more consistent 
um, jitter-free experience. And there's an ITRO security chip, which is uh, managing and monitoring our hardware um, to ensure that it's working as efficiently as possible. And in terms of networking, um, the key feature for that Nitro delivers is enhanced networking. <clears throat> enhanced networking is a basically a technology that uses SRIOV or PCI pass-through to essentially get the hypervisor layer out of the way. All of virtualization is premised on hyper, uh, virtualization adding an overhead to your network path or your storage path. We essentially take it out of the way by providing you near um, access directly to the underlying hardware. Um, and that improves both your latency um, and your packet rate. As Nick was mentioning, packet rate is relevant in many circumstances. Many applications require small packets instead of uh, being able to use jumbo packets. In those circumstances, it's very important to send uh, packets efficiently and fast. So enhanced networking substantially improves your packet rate performance and substantially lowers your latency and jitter. And just as an instantiation, uh, this graph shows how latency has improved uh, within a placement group in our network. This shows the last four generations of the compute optimized instance types. Starting with CC2, this is our first, um, like this is the first instance that gave us 10 gigabits networking. However, this was not using enhanced networking. C3 was the first instance where we introduced this enhanced networking concept. And you see a substantial decrease, more than half latency. And I'm showing you latency in both the average and the worst case, because as you know, many applications are very tuned to how your worst case performance is. And our goal is to provide you with the same consistent performance, not just uh, when you're operating normally, but even when you're operating in the worst case environments. What is not as clear in this graph because of the um, uh, because of the y-axis, is how that performance has continued to improve across generations. This is the same enhanced networking technology. It has transitioned. We have added more and more features of Nitro. Um, that has led to near halving of the performance from uh, latency performance from C3 to C5. Within two generations now, we are under 50 um, microseconds. This is round trip time, by the way within a placement group. Most applications can kind of, would really like to have that kind of performance and would be very efficient in running. So you've seen a step improvement in performance. I wanted to talk how that has evolved and what kind of technologies went in and how with each, imp uh, with each uh, generation, we provided newer features that, can, that have benefited to with C5 providing us, providing you the best possible networking experience today on AWS. So this is showing a, a hardware and software configuration of a CC2 instance. This was pre-Nitro. Um, it uses the Zen hypervisor and uses para virtualization to send your storage and network traffic through DOM0 and onto the underlying network resources. Um, obviously, you're passing through DOM0. There is a lot of contention there. There's a lot of functionality. So you are inevitably going to encounter some latency and jitter. How do we get rid of those things? Um, we bypass uh, hypervisor. Um, we use the technology uh, called SRIOV, which is basically single root IO virtualization. It exposes virtual functions um, straight into the uh, instance that you're running. And they are exposed as in, uh, using Intel drivers uh, directly to your Elastic Network interfaces. What it achieves is by bypassing the hypervisor, your latency falls down, as, as you saw in the previous graph. But even more important, your jitter, your variation falls down substantially because not, you're not in the DOM0 path anymore. Uh, we used just some geeking out a little bit. We used. Um, Intel 82599 as our chip that, that provided this technology. And as you can see, there's a loopback cable um, that goes to our network card, which actually does all the v, uh, VPC processing. Um, provided a substantial improvement, uh, but as you can see, storage is still um, going through DOM0. I wanted to jump to C4 here. There are two things that happened differently. One is we went to our second generation of Nitro cards. This was actually based off 
Annapurna Labs ASIC. You might have heard that name a few times uh, uh, at this reinvent or previous ones as well. Um, it's a, it was an Israeli startup that was developing these ASICs that we really liked, and we decided to incorporate them in C4. We liked them so much that we actually acquired them around this time. So now all the improvements that we have seen, including the A1, um, all these have come from custom ASICs that we developed. Um, the other nuance here to realize is that we started providing EBS optimized by default. What that meant is previous, before C4, um, all the instances shared the network and storage path. You could actually choose to enable EBS optimized as an option, but that meant that your network throughput would have been reduced. With this option, now you get a dedicated network and storage by default, no surcharge, uh, et cetera. So while C4 was still providing 10 gigabits of performance, same as C3, you're actually getting more throughput for applications that required both storage and network access. That's led to a lot of improvement in bandwidth performance, obviously. Now let's jump to C5. Um, I'm jumping a few steps here. This is not a nitro deep dive. I would, if you're interested in this, I would highly encourage you to go to that nitro deep dive. There is a lot of technology underneath and a lot of discussion on how multiple evolutions happen. But jumping to C5, there are a few things have changed here now. Um, one is, as you can see inside the instance, we have got ENA. So this is something that we developed um, as our own custom network device. I'll go into a few more details on why that was relevant. But that provided us the best possible performance and even higher throughput and even over lo lower latency uh, compared to what Intel was able to provide before. <coughs> and you see also the Nitro hypervisor. This is a lightweight hypervisor that we've developed um, that manages the CPU and memory in an efficient way and allows you to get virtually all of the CPU resources and the memory resources of the underlying hardware directly for your applications. Um, many of our you know, customers have benchmarked this to be near bare metal performance, so no virtualization or overhead for most applications. That benefits, obviously, networking was already um, not bypassed, but now you can see your applications are benefiting, and that actually leads to better performance across the board. And that's the evolution of Nitro. It's providing you the best possible performance, getting uh, our software out of the way, and delivering you the best possible uh, application performance. Obviously, we have done all this offload, so uh, we, decided, we realized that we could have uh, the hypervisor removed completely, and bunch of the offload is already on the network cards. So um, you can now use uh, a bare metal instance directly if your application requires, for example, virtualization uh, functions that the, uh, that the underlying uh, uh, CPUs provide. You can use bare metal instances. This we launched this year. Um, so this was kind of the evolution of Nitro. So now let's look back at one of the technologies that I mentioned here, which was ENA. Um, as I mentioned, we switched from Intel to ENA uh, in, in this evolution of Nitro because uh, as our instances, as our uh, hardware was getting denser, we were putting more and more CPU and memory resources, uh, our customers were also asking for more performance, network performance. As I said, C3 and C4 were both providing 10 gigabits performance, which was great, but customers were asking for even more, and how could we achieve that? We wanted to develop a driver that was future-proof uh, beyond not just thinking about 20 gigs or 25 gigs or so on, but future-proof to 400 gigs. And if you might have noticed, we did increase our performance yesterday on our latest generation instances. We are at, um, uh, at yesterday's, uh, at last night's keynote, we announced C5N, which delivers 100 gigabits performance um, to your instance, uh, to a single instance pair. Um, ENA also provided other benefits, which is increasing the queues, and this is very relevant for packet-bound applications, which, which require high packet processing. Uh, using more queues spreads out uh, performance across your virtual uh, CPUs, so that you're not bottlenecked inside your instance and trying to send high packet rate. Uh, the increased queues helps us also uh, to deliver better performance. For example, C5, 
uh, has eight queues, um, which is more than the two queues that Intel provided. But now C5N has gone, pushed that up to 32 queues. That can, delivering 100 gigs is, is a multi-step process, obviously. You have to have the network. You have to have the hardware. And you have to have the support inside the instance. And optimizing your instance requires using more queues. So we have delivered that with C5N. Uh, ENA reduced the latency and jitter as we had seen before. Uh, it's a new driver. It is now, uh, however, it is now available for the uh, for the last two years, and we have had broad operating system support across all of our partners. Uh, something new here to announce is uh, we just a couple of weeks back we introduced the 2.0 version of the driver. It's still fully backward and forward compatible. If you're running 1.x versions, you can run 2.0. Uh, however, it actually it further improves your latency performance and your packet rate performance because of features that we introduced. Uh, low latency queues that can reduce your average and tail latencies even further, um, and checksum offloads. So just as an example, uh, going back to that graph, I've added another line at the, another bar at the end um, that shows the latency improvements with this ENA 2.0. This is again available on the same C5 instance that you're running. All you need to do is just up update your driver, and you get this uh, reduction of almost 20% uh, in both your average and tail latencies. So we've seen the evolution on Nitro and, uh, uh, and shown it to you on how uh, latency has improved. Uh, the way we advertise our instances is obviously throughput and bandwidth, and that's something that um, you guys can uh, latch on to directly uh, from our um, uh, instance specifications. This is how we have evolved our bandwidth. Um, two things to note here. One is instance and storage separation. So you can see um, increasing performance from C3 to C4 uh, and C4 to C5. And now, obviously, your networking is no longer bottlenecked because of C5N. Your high-performance computing applications can scale out even f faster. I wanted to highlight something that is kind of implicit here. All of these are running the same drivers, um, standard drivers that we run. A C5 uh, instance, the machine image that you're running on C5, you can start running on C5N and get that performance improvement. This is not a custom implementation or a custom driver where you need to rewrite your applications. Is available natively the same secure elastic way that we deliver all of EC2. It is available not just within a small constrained cluster, it's available within an availability zone, within a region, to and from S3. So your big data applications can start running much faster because now you're downloading much faster and hydrating your data much faster, backing up data much faster. Uh, your machine learning applications can run faster because of distributed uh, capabilities. Um, your network-bound applications can scale up, scale down, scale out uh, independently now of CPU and memory because your, your throughput has increased. Obviously, 100 gigs is great, but it's not just 100 gigs. It's available on smaller sizes. So many of you don't run largest instance types um, or instance sizes. Uh, you can see that the smaller sizes can deliver up to 25 gigabits of performance. Um, if your application is network bound, C5N would be great. However, it's not just about that. It's about having a diverse choice. So T3, our first uh, burstable instance type built on Nitro, delivers up to five gigabits of performance. Our general uh, class families of C5, M5, R5, these are the compute and memory optimized. Depending on your application, you, get, uh, you can choose which instance type. You're not constrained on um, networking performance. If, you're, if your application is network bound, choose C5N, and now you're going to get great performance there as well. Our goal here is to have networking not be a bottleneck, and we are trying to make that uh, realistic. Um, so I've talked a bit about latency and throughput. And the third thing uh, is packet rate. Now, packet rate is kind of dependent on a multitude of factors, uh, applications, um, instance configuration, VPC configuration, so on and so forth. So it's not 
it's hard to quantify how the improvement is there. We obviously see a lot of improvement as I showed 20x improvement, um, but I wanted to quantify it better with a customer uh, anecdote. Netflix um, is implementing a large microservices architecture. Um, the characteristic there is you get a bunch of requests, you need to cache those requests, and all of these microservices are going to go read from that request cache. Uh, every request is a single packet, um, so lots of requests means lots of packets. And obviously, it's based off memcached, so your average latency uh, requirements are really stringent. You do, obviously, that means you would read locally uh, from, um, uh, you have a distributed system across AZs for uh, availability and redundancy. You read locally and write globally. How did Netflix benefit here? Um, they, when, they, uh, when, they, uh, when we launched C5, they benchmarked C5. Uh, they were running on M4, which was, by the way, again, an enhanced networking-based instance. Uh, it was running in uh, the Intel technology. This is just a transition from an M4 to a C5, so enhanced networking to an ENA. The capabilities of Nitro system and the capabilities of ENA has improved the packet rate performance so substantially that they have now scaled down from 10 instances to a single instance. They could run all of their region traffic within a single instance. Obviously, they will distribute it and have multiple instances available, one each AC, et cetera. But now they could run it um, so much more efficiently. At, if you do a, a price analysis, it's almost a 90% cost savings. Obviously, the latency improvements that I talked about also helped in improving their uh, application performance. but the PPS drove down their cost substantially. <laughs> so Nitro is great, ENA is great. Um, how do you uh, get that performance? As I said, most of our newest generation instances are going to be built on uh, Nitro. And running those instances would require you to have ENA capabilities. So. The one thing that you need to do before you launch those instances is check that your AMI has enhanced networking enabled with ENA. Uh, obviously, you would need to have the drivers inside uh, the, the uh, machine image so that it boots up properly once it's launched. Uh, but as I mentioned before, most of our partners, almost all of our partners now have ENA support enabled. So if you take any marketplace army, any quick start army, all of them have ENA support built in. Just take an image, run it, and you'll get the best performance that we could deliver today. However, that's not all. Um, ENA is great for most applications, for most, um, in fact, almost all applications that are network constrained can benefit from it. There are certain applications that can be developed uh, in a way to take advantage of even better performance. And the, that is based off this Intel Data Plane Development Kit uh, technology. Uh, it's basically a set of C libraries and drivers. It enables faster processing by bypassing the kernel inside your instance. So I talked a bit about bypassing the software in, in our stack. This is going into your instance and now optimizing performance there. Uh, you can get more control of packet processing. You can decide which queues are pinned where. You can, you can send traffic accordingly. And you can reduce your CPU overhead further. Uh, just getting a little bit deeper into it, your typical application is going to talk to, through the Linux networking stack and to the drivers there, which goes down to our uh, underlying hardware. Uh, a DPDK application instead talks to a user space driver. Um, we have got support for ENA in, uh, in DPDK, 16x and beyond. And because of this bypass, you're not going to get TCP, obviously, at the TCP kernel stack, but you can get much more control and you can bypass the kernel so your performance improves the same way that bunch of the SRIV technology improves our perform uh, improved performance with enhanced networking. Similar technologies can help here improve your performance. Now, I'd caution that it's not, um, it's not based off TCP. So you're not going to be able to 
support an application straight away. But if your application, uh, if you, you are, but I would encourage you to review this and see if your application is suitable for this kind of an access pattern. We support it on both our enhanced networking modes, obviously uh, the Intel one and ENA. Um, and we've seen our customers be able to get substantial performance improvements depending on whether their application can take advantage of those access patterns. Um, before I go on uh, to hand it off to Nick, I just wanted to emphasize um, the key takeaway here, um, take, an, take an AMI with ENA enabled, run it on our latest generation instances. Uh, depending on your requirements, you now have a diverse range available from up to five gigs on T3 to 100 gigs on C5N. Um, I'm sure you'd really like the performance and uh, so that I'll switch to Nick. Thank you, Daddy. Mic on? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so we've got, sort of gone over like the, the global basics. We've talked about what's sort of available in AWS, what sort of tweaks we can do. Like he says, mostly you know use latest instances, use DPDK if you want to really get that last little bit of performance increase out of your application, and you like writing like C code. Um, so let's talk about some other things that you've got control over. So you have control over the type of architectural choices you make. Uh, so whether or not you're going to be using placement groups, uh, whether or not your traffic's going over VPN or Direct Connect, whether or not uh, what sort of load balancers you might be using for your applications, uh, as well as things like uh, you know going to S3 and whatnot. So if we start off, I you know I do a lot of performance sort of talks with customers and stuff. And one of the common questions I get, and I love answering because it's such a fun answer, is they're like, can I, how much bandwidth can I get on my VPC? The answer is as much as you want. Like, you know, unless you're going to overrun all the bandwidth we have in that region. If you want to run like terabits of capacity in one of our smaller regions, then you should probably talk to us. But other than that, you don't have to worry about it. Like, there's no VPC level bandwidth limit you need to worry about. Uh, same thing goes for an, any given availability zone or subnet. All on premises, these things have limits because there's hardware boxes running this. We run sort of a, a different type of network, you don't have to worry about that. There's not sort of um, a concrete thing that's gonna fall over if you send too much traffic to it. Uh, same thing for internet gateway. Like how much, is, will my internet great gateway fall over if I send too much traffic to it? Because you think like a gateway is like a physical box that creaks and sort of squeaks whenever you send too much traffic to it. Not the case. It's a logical construct and you don't have to worry about the bandwidth of that thing. So internet gateway, there's no limits on that. Uh, send as much as you want there. Uh, NAT Gateway's got a similar story. So NAT Gateway, uh, we provision a certain amount of bandwidth for, for all customers, and we sort of chose a number there, and that number is, you know, customers can send up to 10 gigabits per second through a NAT Gateway on a sustained basis. If you, and it can burst above that uh, quite a bit. Uh, but if you're gonna go and sustain more than 10 gigs, then uh, you should probably just provision more NAT Gateways. Um, or you come talk to us and we can figure something out. But um, essentially NAT Gateway, for most customers, most use cases, you won't need to worry about it. Although, uh, you do get 65,000 ports to a single destination, so maybe you run out of that before uh, you run out of bandwidth. On the peering side of things, uh, when you do VPC peering between two VPCs, uh, for most functionality, those VPCs are now the, sort of the same. And so, from a, a bandwidth perspective, there's also not like a magic peering pipe. Like, if you send traffic between two VPCs, and you have VPC peering there, it's just like sending it within the same VPC. There's no performance impact. Uh, it's just like it's in the same VPC from a performance perspective. There's no latency hit and those kinds of things. So you can send traffic between two VPCs, no bandwidth limits, uh, no worries there. Uh, so the places where there are actual limits and things you need to design around is around the actual instance itself. So every instance itself has its own bandwidth and packets per second limits and those kinds of things. And that's some of the instance family stuff that Vishesh talked about. Uh, in terms of aggregate bandwidth limits, each instance type and family has more uh, and, and different types of limits. So ENA-based instances have limits up to 25 gigabits per second. You can get that within a placement group or across availability zones. That's something we enabled in January of uh, this year. Uh, to S3, you can, as of, again, this year, you can do uh, 25 gigabits per second to S3. I mean, given you still have to might do some things in S3 around multi-flows and those kinds of things, but the network is not the bottleneck uh, to S3, up to 25 gigs. Uh, 
you know, I mentioned placement group before and, and, sort, of, and sort of when we're talking about latency. So uh, placement group basically makes make sure that your instances are very, very close together. So essentially like microseconds. Um, and because they're so close, we also are able to run larger flows there. So a single TCP flow, which means like one TCP port or like one single HTTP application, um, will be able to get up to 10 gigabits per second. So a single TCP or UDP flow up to 10 gigs per second. Uh, everywhere else, if I didn't mention it, five gigs. If I didn't mention it up here, you were asking a question, you weren't sure what it was, five gigs. So uh, the instance, the aggregate instance bandwidth is five gigs, and the, the per flow limit is five gigs for pretty much anything I didn't mention here. If we start talking about uh, connectivity back to all premises, so if we create a, a VPN to our virtual private gateway, which is the service we have that does manage VPN, uh, each one of those VPN connections is made of two tunnels. Most customers by far will only use one, and that's probably the easiest. Um, each one of those tunnels can do 1.25 gigabits per second. The aggregate limit for the virtual private gateway, if you manage to load up different traffic across different tunnels, is about four gigs. But for intents and purposes, it's 1.25 gigs for, for VPN. Uh, and that's specifically just for VPN. So the other question I get sometimes is, what about Direct Connect? Does that 1.25 gig limit matter for Direct Connect? The answer is no. So the only port or the only speed limit you're dealing with when you have uh, Direct Connect is the physical sport, port speeds of your Direct Connect. So we can do things like link aggregation. So you can put, if you want 40 gigabits per second of uh, bandwidth, you can get four 10 gig ports. We can put them in a link aggregation so they look like one big 40 gig port and you can get that into you know, very, very high bandwidth. So we're not really, we, we've got a lot of speed there on Direct Connect. Uh, we're still limited by that five gig aggregate flow, so any given instance over Direct Connect is still limited to both the five gig aggregate limit as well as the five gig flow limit. Uh, to show sort of an interesting example of this is some customers have said like, hey, I wanna do, I don't know, 10, 20 gigabits per second of VPN traffic over maybe Direct Connect or VPN because maybe they want to encrypt a Direct Connect circuit, something like that. Uh, so I, I work with one of the partners uh, called Aviatrix. They developed this thing called Insane Mode um, for VPN where essentially they have their instances uh, here. We can see that up top there's two instances. These are sort of normal application instances. There's just one in the middle, like the forwarder instance, and you've got two on the bottom, which are sort of the, the VPN instances. And the way this actually works is to get around the five gig limit per instance is they use the, the instance in the middle to essentially uh, proxy or load balance traffic across many, many instances, uh, up to five in this, this model, right? So you set this as the default route for pretty much all your instances. Then you create, in this, in this scenario, I've drawn up two instances, so they each have uh, tunnels going back on premises that can do up to five gigs. Uh, if you decide to, to host your own VPN on AWS, you can go past the 1.25 limits that we have uh, particularly if you're on like C5 and M5 instances. Uh, so in theory, you get five gigs of uh, bandwidth to these each instance. They forward to the, the sort of proxy forwarder, and then it aggregates the bandwidth from all those uh, VPN instances. And so um, they can get cumulatively up to about you know, 22 to 25 gigs there. Uh, in terms of some of the testing they've seen on C5, particularly around packets per second and VPN, because you tend not to have very large packets there, uh, you know, they saw about a two gig per second increase from the C4 to the C5. So, uh, pretty cool story there, and nice little show of an example of how you can take some of our limits, and if you can horizontally scale, you're probably better off with your application. Uh, network load balancer. So network load balancer is a high performance load balancer for us. Uh, the two load balancers we recommend are application load balancer and network load balancer. Application load balancer is for L7, HTTP, path, host space, things that do SSL offload, that kind of thing. If you just want to send packets, send the packets fast. Network load balancer is the suggested load balancer. So it supports TCP, uh, it's high performance, you get one IP for each availability zone, which can be handy for whitelisting. From a performance perspective, when you launch a network load balancer, you get uh, roughly five gigs of bandwidth just allocated to you. Uh, and so on some of the older load balancers, like the classic load balancer, you have to do things like pre-warming to tell us, you know, like, hey, I'm about to receive a lot of traffic, can you give me some more capacity? Uh, Network Load Balancer has uh, pretty much removed that. And the way that actually works is this little thing called Hyperplane. So we started talking about Hyperplane uh, last year at reInvent. It's an, uh, a platform we've been using 
for some of our internal services. Uh, well, they're services that you actually use. So Hyperplane is essentially this uh, horizontally scalable state management fleet. Uh, it has, from a total capacity in the region, in the range of terabits of, of bandwidth. Uh, and it's currently supporting things like network load balancer, uh, EFS mounts, uh, NAT gateway, private link, um, and also now transit gateway. Some of you may have seen that release last night. So the concept here is we've got this fleet. As you add instances or attachments, so in this scenario, um, you know, a network load balancer into an availability zone or a uh, transit gateway attachment or a NAT gateway in that availability zone. Uh, we basically give you, the, with that network interface, this is also how you get one network interface per availability zone. With that, we give you shards of bandwidth across that fleet. And so with multiple customers, we can distribute this load uh, very fairly so that one, no one customer really overlaps with another. So as you add more network interfaces and as we add more hosts and more tenants to this, we distribute all of that load requirements across the fleet. So this makes sure that like, if any given instance fails, that you don't have a bad day. If any one of our customers wants to use a ton of bandwidth, other people don't have a bad day. So this makes it very easy for us to scale horizontally and also um, keep latency low, because in this model, we're about tens of microseconds of latency, particularly for network load balancer. Uh, and so it's sort of the underlying architecture that helps to understand like the performance when people ask me like you know how does transit gateway perform like what bandwidth do I get through it or what's the latency or um, if I use network load balancer what's the performance and a lot of it comes down to the same underlying concept and even though the data plane is per availability zone uh, and many times so like NAT gateway is only one availability zone but like network load balancer and transit gateway are regional concepts that sort of bring all of those kind of concepts together uh, to see what this actually looks like for customers, we did some tests last year on network load balancer and like, well, how well does this scale up? Like, does, do we have any limits or does this actually work? Um, the answer is yes, luckily. Um, so we ran this, te this test. We have a tool called Bees with the Machine Guns. Um, it basically sends out distributed sets of, uh, they call them bees, that then do requests to your, uh, your server. And you can just test tons of bandwidth because if you can horizontally scale your application, you can do lots of requests. So we support, we did here, uh, it looks like a million uh, connections. And we started scaling it up. I think the, we started scaling around, uh, what is that, 1,500? I don't know, a lot. All I know is that we started around eight gigs of bandwidth and scaled up to about 40 gigs of bandwidth on the network load balancer. And we didn't have any sort of uh, errors or timeouts or 500s or anything like that through that process. And then we decided to not stop wasting all the resources and just say 40 gigs is probably a lot. Uh, performance testing. So, okay, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, uh, some of these concepts. How do you actually test these things? Um, when it comes down to testing, there's a lot of options. So there's, uh, there's a lot of different impacts. So, like, can we get up here and tell you every number of every instance and, you know, all the numbers and MTUs and all this theoretical stuff that, you know, there's a lot of inputs and outputs to actually, at the end of the day, have one result to your application. And so uh, the answer is yes, we could. And sometimes it's helpful, but really, really what you need to do is probably test it. Uh, so uh, it, it, the, like I said, the amount of flows you're using, the location of those, the latencies, the, uh, the type of application you're testing, is it TCP or UDP, um, as well as like, sometimes the, you just have to test the network either first or last. Like, if you think it's a network problem, you have to prove it's not. If you've tested everything else, and you're not sure what it is, it might be a network problem. And so knowing where, that's, where in that sort of performance testing scenario you're at is very important because doing all this testing and finding out that, oh, hey, we should just put some more PyOps on our EBS volume, right? You know, upgrading bigger instance types and tweaking network settings may not help you there if you actually have a disk problem. And so this advice and this, a lot of this presentation, quite honestly, is, is helpful if you've already understood that the network is your bottleneck or network is the problem. So make sure you've actually gone and tested some of those other things. You've gone and looked at your CPU, your memory, uh, your NUMA configuration, a whole bunch of those types of other tweaks you can look at um, to improve performance without actually messing with the network. If it is the network, then um, let's find that out. Uh, there's a couple ways we can do that. So you can do load testing, like just how much load can I put on this thing at once, or how many packets per second can I throw through this thing, or how many transactions per second can I do, and maybe if you know there's some like parts of your application that work differently, like one is a heavy load and one's a less load. 
if you load it up on the less load, then you can find out what the actual limits are. And so that's more of your application-based testing. You've also got sort of the benchmark testing, like just raw numbers. Like if I've I got this type of instance, if I throw as much UDP traffic as I can, how much bandwidth or packets per second do I get out of that? And you, you can use that in combination with your sort of environmental test to know where the limits are at, where you're gonna start running into problems. You know, if, if we get to this number, we start dropping packets, so let's not do that in, in production. And so maybe we need a larger instance type if we go to the, above that number. So on the tip side of things, uh, the first thing you can do is, I like testing with iPerf. It's my second favorite tool after ping. Um, so you can test your latency, you can test the bandwidth. Uh, I usually start with, I usually use capital P and do you know, five or 10 uh, flows just to see, you know, am I running any sort of flow limits? You can do crazy things like test 100 or 1,000 uh, flows just to see if that changes your performance characteristics. Uh, sometimes I'll go in there and I'll put the lowercase u in there for UDP. That way I'll just throw as much bandwidth at it as I can and see what it can take, even if you know, latency and other products are not really in the, in the flow there. Uh, we've got a link to the bees with machine gun stuff if you want to play with that. Um, as well, we've got some benchmark sort of articles on how to test this. And we've also recently published some operating system level t tweaks on what you can do on like Windows and Linux uh, to make your network and your operating system sort of play together nicely. So I mean, the, the real summary here is um, TCP is a global concept. Understand that the latency and some of the ways that those work with the system, and especially your applications, how that might be interacting with your particular bottlenecks. Uh, understand what we have, you know, use Jumbo to use if you can, you just use the latest instances, make sure enhanced networking is turned on. Uh, know the right architecture, so know what the limits of the architecture are, and you know, try to scale out horizontally if you can, because that tends to be how you get to very high performance. Uh, as well, you know, just test it out and be sort of very thorough about that if, if performance is really important for your application. So that's what we got. Thanks everybody for coming. We'll be up here answering questions and, and whatnot, so uh, thanks for coming.